Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Great. Well, I think we'll move on to the next talk here. Um, that was fantastic. I actually took notes and learned a lot. Thank you, Alicia. Um, we're going to con continue with talking here now about bone health and radionucleotide therapy in patients with advanced prostate cancer. And again, I want to thank you for your attention and thank the AUA and Drs. Gerard and Cookson for including me on the faculty here. Um, trying to advance my slides. Perhaps I'll just do the same thing, Dr. Morgan said. Just say next slide, please. These are my disclosures. And again, we can't have access to doing this. When we think about learning objectives, um, we're going to talk about the AUA guidelines, specifically about bone health management um, in various advanced prostate cancer disease states, how to proactively identify and manage side effects uh, related to skeletal related events in patients with advanced prostate cancer. And importantly, I learned to identify and prescribe radionucleotide therapies in appropriate situations for patients with symptomatic MCRPC. So let's start with talking about bone health. We'll really divide this talk into two parts. The first part of the talk is going to discuss bone health. The second part of the talk is going to discuss radionucleotide therapy. So when we think about bone health in prostate cancer patients, we have to think about two concepts. We have to think about the issue of bone loss and the issue of bone metastasis. The issue of bone loss here is highly relevant because the median age of patients with advanced prostate cancer, and in particular CRPC, is the population of patients that are at risk already for physiologic age-related decline in bone mineral density. We add to that androgen deprivation therapy, which has been associated with an acceleration in the loss of bone mineral density. In fact, it's been estimated that patients may lose between 2 and 4% of bone mineral density in their first year on androgen deprivation therapy. And as we are aware, that loss in bone mineral density increases their risk of subsequent bone fracture. At the same time, we have the issue of bone metastasis to be vigilant about because bone is a frequent site of prostate cancer metastasis. When bone metastasis occur, they can significantly negatively impact patients' quality of life, resulting in pain, hypercalcemia, and a variety of situations collectively referred to as skeletal related events, pathologic fracture, spinal cord compression, need for surgical decompression, or external beam radiotherapy. Now, when we think about the issue of bone loss, we have to start by identifying risk factors for bone loss and proactively seeking these out in our patient history, older patient age, previous fracture history, parental hip fracture history, lower body weight, and then alcohol and smoking history, in particular among patients uh, with prostate cancer, androgen deprivation therapy, as I mentioned, steroid utilization, radiation therapy, and then a variety of other medication usages. This is a table from a prior um, SEER Medicare study, which really kind of quantifies the association between androgen deprivation therapy and fracture risk, as well as demonstrates the dose dependence of this relationship, as you can see greater use of hormone therapy with a higher risk of fracture, including uh, orchiectomy associated with an increase in fracture risk. This study then went and subsequently quantified the association between fracture and overall survival among men with prostate cancer on ADT. And you can see here significantly shorter overall survival among men who experience a fracture while on ADT for prostate cancer. Now, how should we be doing our assessment at baseline? And we started to talk about this in the last case uh, before the break here. Baseline uh, assessment of patients with advanced prostate cancer that are being initiated on ADT may include a bone density or what's known as a DEXA scan. This test can quantify patients' risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis. It can be obtained at baseline when initiating ADT and then roughly every one to two years after to evaluate for changes in bone mineral density. Baseline blood tests that can be obtained in patients starting androgen deprivation therapy include calcium, creatinine, and vitamin D levels. Now, when we look at our AUA guideline recommendations for bone health in advanced prostate cancer patients from the 2020 guidelines, the guidelines advise us that clinicians should discuss the risk of osteoporosis associated with androgen deprivation therapy, as well as the risk of fracture. The AUA guidelines recommend preventative treatment for these patients with supplemental calcium, vitamin D, and then behavioral modification, including weight-bearing exercise and smoking cessation. 
when we think about vitamin and calcium, vitamin D and calcium supplementation, the guidelines advise calcium at 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams daily, vitamin D at 1,000 IUs daily, and these are largely consistent with the National Osteoporosis Foundation guidelines for men a, a over the age of 50 as well. Vitamin D has been demonstrated in this meta-analysis of randomized trials to decrease the risk of both hip fracture and non-vertebral fracture significantly um, when provided in patients over the age of 60. When we think about calcium, a couple of important uh, practice points. Calcium is better absorbed when delivered in divided doses. The formulation of calcium citrate has been found to be better absorbed than calcium carbonate. It's important to know that calcium supplementation alone does not prevent bone mineral density loss. It has to be given together with vitamin D. In fact, there are conflicting data that we should be aware of on calcium and cardiovascular disease, as well as calcium and fatal prostate cancer. So all of this supplementation represents a balance of risks, and we will often be asked about that by our patients. And I think it's important that we counsel them that in these situations, particularly when patients are being treated, as we will talk about, with bone-modifying agents like zoledronic acid and erosumab, where there is a risk of hypocalcemia, that risk balances the other risks of cardiovascular disease and prostate cancer. Now, again, when we look at our AUA guidelines that were updated this year in 2020, the recommendation for bone protective agents, denosumab and zoledronic acid, is specifically in patients with MCRPC and bony metastasis. So when we are thinking about prescribing a bone protective agent to prevent skeletal related events, the indication per guidelines is MCRPC with bone metastasis. Um, and that is a very similar recommendation as to what's put forth in the NCCN guidelines. Now let's talk about each of these agents. Zoledronic acid is in the bisphosphonate class of medications and thereby works to inhibit bone resorption. It's an IV medication. And in the setting of MCRPC with bone metastasis, the dosing is four milligrams every four weeks. We'll come back to this later when we talk about zoledronic acid in different disease states. But MCRPC with bone mets, it's every four weeks. In fact, it's the only bisphosphonate medication to demonstrate a benefit in this disease state for decreasing skeletal-related events. Important toxicities to be aware of, osteonecrosis of the jaw. Therefore, these patients need careful dental examination. Hypocalcemia. Therefore, these patients need calcium supplementation and monitoring of calcium levels while on therapy, nephrotoxicity, and a flu-like uh, symptom complex, which is sort of an acute phase reaction. This acute phase reaction is fever, myalgias, arthralgias. It occurs in up to a third of patients. It occurs typically within the 30, first 36 hours after treatment. It's been found to be much more common during the first dosing of zoledronic acid and then get less severe over time. And largely the management here is conservative therapy. With regard to the importance of renal toxicity, here's a table that was available in your handout for how to dose adjust zoledronic acid in patients with compromised renal function based on their calculated creatinine clearance. Denosumab is a human monoclonal antibody against a rank ligand. It inhibits osteoclast mediated bone destruction. As opposed to zoledronic acid, which is intravenous, denosumab is sub Q. But again, when given in the setting of bone metastatic CRPC, it's every four weeks in terms of its dosing interval. Toxicity is very similar, osteonecrosis of the jaw, so dental examination, hypocalcemia, so supplement calcium and monitor the levels. Now, I've used this term osteonecrosis of the jaw several different times. I think it's important that we understand what this is. This is basically a non-healing bone ulcer in the absence of metastatic disease. So it's exposed bone in the maxillofacial area without the presence of documented metastatic disease. Typically, it's no evidence of healing after six weeks of uh, appropriate evaluation. How do we manage these patients? Uh, these patients really should be referred for dental evaluation and care as quickly as possible. Risk factors to be aware of for osteonecrosis of the jaw, patients with malignancy, patients who've received radiotherapy, corticosteroid use, but important and modifiable risk factors, dental hygiene, dental work, poorly fitting dentures. And all of these can be accelerated in patients receiving bisphosphonate therapy or denosumab treatment. How do you minimize the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw? The best prophylaxis is excellent oral hygiene. Limit alcohol and tobacco use, obtain a pretreatment dental assessment, and if any dental procedures are necessary, if possible, complete these 
prior to initiating treatment and avoid dental extractions in particular during treatment with denosumab or zoledronic acid because the dental extraction significantly increases the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw. Regular dental visits are recommended during the time of treatment as well. Now, what if a patient on zoledronic acid or denosumab develops osteonecrosis of the jaw? Generally, the recommendation is to withhold treatment until the osteonecrosis has healed or at least stabilized. Vast majority of osteonecrosis cases can be managed conservatively, antibiotics, oral rinses, but these patients really should be referred to either oral surgery or um, a dentist for limited debridement, and, and cases that are refractory to conservative management may require accelerated forms of therapy, including hyperbaric oxygen. Now, I mentioned that there are two options that are available for these patients, zoledronic acid and denosumab. Is there a preferred agent? In fact, these agents have been compared head-to-head -head in a prospective randomized trial that was published almost a decade ago in The Lancet. 1,900 men with metastatic CRPC, randomized to denosumab or zoledronic acid. And what you can see from the Kaplan-Meier curve here is that patients who received denosumab had a statistically significant longer time to first skeletal related event. Um, there was no difference in overall survival or time to disease progression. When they looked at side effect profile, hypocalcemia was nearly two times more likely to occur in patients who received denosumab than zoledronic acid, and that was highly statistically significant. Osteonecrosis of the jaw was relatively rare and not significantly different between the medications. When again, we think about these head to head, zoledronic acid IV, denosumab sub Q, acute phase reaction, yes with zoledronic acid, no with denosumab, renal toxicity, yes with zoledronic acid, no with denosumab, hypocalcemia, two times more common with denosumab, osteonecrosis can occur with either one, not significantly different. So because of that statistically significant longer time demonstrated on that head-to-head -head trial to time to first scale related event, the preferred agent is denosumab or zoledronic acid. That's also consistent with NCCM guidelines. You can see for M1 CRPC, when we're talking about preventing scale related events, bone resorptive therapy denosumab is preferred. Now, what about bone modifying agents in other prostate cancer disease states? Up to this time, I focused specifically on MCRPC with bone metastasis. So what about the castration sensitive prostate cancer or hormone sensitive prostate cancer, hormone naive with bone metastasis? In fact, zoledronic acid has been tested in a randomized trial in this setting and found not to increase time to first scale related event versus placebo, so it's not recommended. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve from the JCO paper. What about patients with M0 CRPC? Denosumab in this setting has likewise been tested in a prospective randomized trial. No overall survival benefit demonstrated, not FDA approved in this setting. At the same time, we've talked about the issue of bone loss as well as bone metastasis. So we can say that bone modifying agents don't prevent scale rate events or improve survival in these other disease settings, but we have to be vigilant about bone loss. Now, as I mentioned at a baseline, when patients are starting on androgen deprivation therapy, they should have a bone density scan to help quantify their risk of bone loss. There is an online calculator from the WHO called the FRAC score, into which very readily uh, available clinical pathologic parameters can be inserted. And a patient's 10-year risk of hip fracture and osteoporosis fracture can be uh, calculated. And if, in fact, patients have a calculated 10-year risk of hip fracture greater than 3% or osteoporosis fracture greater than 20%, then bone-modifying agents are recommended not to prevent skeletal-related events, but to prevent bone loss. And the concept here is early intervention to increase bone mineral density, decrease the fracture risk. In this setting, zoledronic acid and denosumab may be used as well as alendronate. But again, I wanna call your attention to the dosing. Remember, bone metastatic CRPC, it was every four weeks. Here, if for zoledronic acid, it's annually. Denosumab, it's every six months. Now, what do our AUA guidelines recommend? Again, coming back to these from the 2020 guidelines, they do recommend preventative treatments with bisphosphonates or denosumab to patients at high fracture risk due to bone loss. How do you assess the fracture risk? Use the FRAX score. So I'm gonna conclude here the first part of this talk, which is on the bone health. When we think about bone health and prostate cancer, we need to be vigilant about bone loss and bone metastasis. Patients with advanced prostate cancer who are initiating ADT should be offered calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Patients with bone metastatic CRPC should be offered denosumab, 
preferred or zoledronic acid. When starting either of these, beware of hypocalcemia, check and supplement calcium levels, beware of osteonecrosis of the jaw, get a pretreatment dental exam, avoid dental procedures while on treatment. Patients on ADT should have a baseline and ongoing assessment of their risk of fracture, get a DEXA scan, use the FRAC score to calculate their risk, and then consider bone modifying agents pending the FRAC score calculated risk of subsequent osteoporosis related fracture. Now I wanna move in the second part of this talk to talk about radiopharmaceuticals in advanced prostate cancer. Why is this relevant? The clinical relevance of bone metastasis is that approximately 90% of patients with MCRPC have bone metastasis. When a patient experiences bone metastasis, it can not only decrease their quantity of, of survival, but it can significantly impact their quality of life, increase disability, increase cost of care, and decrease survival. Now, prior to 2013, the armamentarian of radionucleotide therapies were strontium and samarium. These are IV agents that were really not designed for improvement of survival, but for palliation of symptomatic bone pain, usually in patients who were not candidates for chemotherapy or other types of radiotherapies. They both risk bone marrow suppression. Samarium has a slightly more favorable toxicity. They remain options for symptom palliation from bone metastasis, and in fact, in prior iterations of the AUA guidelines as recently as 2015, they were grouped together under the term radionucleotide therapy. But fortunately, we now have more uh, options here and specifically in the form of radium-223 or alpharidin. This structure mimics calcium and thereby targets bone specifically at areas of increased bone turnover, such as bone metastasis. Uniquely, this functions as an alpha emitting radiopharmaceutical, so it has a short wavelength, and because of that, there's minimal exposure to surrounding tissues, including the bone marrow. There is no restrictions on contact during treatment, and it functions by inducing double-stranded DNA breaks in cancer cells. Radium-223 is given as an IV infusion. The dosage is once every four weeks for six total treatments. The treatments are very quick, less than a minute, and can be done in an office setting with specialized setup. It is excreted through the GI tract so patients can get diarrhea and nausea. And despite the alpha emitting, the key AE to be aware of is lymphocytopenia. 20% of patients can experience grade three to four of this. So it's important that you check a CBC at baseline and then continue to monitor it before each dose. The data to support radium-223 really comes from this New England Journal of Publication, the Alsimka phase three randomized placebo controlled trial. Over 900 patients with MCRPC Bone mets, no visceral mets, critical to know about use of radium, can be either before or OF after dose ataxyl, and it was roughly evenly split, you can see here. Primary endpoint of the trial was overall survival, and what you can see from the Kaplan-Meier curve here was that radium-223 significantly prolonged overall survival from 11.3 months in the placebo-treated patients to 14.9 months with radium-223. As you might expect, based on its mechanism of action, Radium-223 also significantly prolonged time to first skeletal-related event. You can see from 9.8 to 15.6 months for a hazard ratio of 0 0.66. When they looked at this forest plot at various subgroups, you could see that patients derived a benefit from radium-223 regardless of whether or not they had received prior docetaxel treatment. When they looked at a variety of different secondary endpoints, including biochemical parameters like alkaline phosphatase or PSA level, again, with each of these, radium-223 significantly benefited patients over placebo. In terms of safety and quality of life, the agent is very well tolerated. In fact, the number of adverse events was lower than with the placebo. There was no clinically meaningful difference in grade three to four events, and there were actually a significant improvement in quality of life among radium-treated patients. Now, when we looked at our prior iterations of the guidelines, when to use radium-223, it was offered as a standard to patients with good performance status, symptomatic bony mets with MCRPC, no visceral disease, pre or post-dose ataxyl. It was also offered as an option to patients with poor performance status when that poor performance status was thought to be directly related to the symptoms of bone mets. In the most recent iteration of the guidelines, this has been simplified to a more clear statement. Clinicians should offer radium-223 to patients with symptoms from bone mets with MCRPC, no visceral metastatic disease, no lymphadenopathy greater than three centimeters. This is very consistent with what our NCCN guidelines offer for M1-CRPC. 
um, in, as first line therapy, it can be used for symptomatic bone mets, category one. Second line therapy after prior abiraterone or enzalutamide, category one, after prior docetaxel. And then again, in subsequent treatments as well in the absence of visceral metastatic disease. Now, what are next steps for radium-223? Um, part of it is going to be, as in each of these treatment decisions for patients with MCRPC, patient selection. So a variety of different parameters have been preliminarily explored to try to identify which patients might most benefit from radium-223. Hopefully, in the future, we will have molecular biomarker stratification for this. We're not there yet. What about retreatment? I mentioned it's six treatments once a month. Um, there is an exploratory data here, as you can see, that in a phase one, two trial did look at using six additional treatments and demonstrated its safety. So perhaps retreatment may be an option moving forward. In addition to that, as we're all, we're discussing combinations and sequencing. So this was a phase 3B open label trial, importantly, not a randomized trial that evaluated outcomes of patients with radium who were treated with concurrent therapies, including abiraterone, enzalutamide, bisphosphonates, and denosumab. It was essentially a post hoc exploratory analysis. And what they found was that patients who received concomitant use of other agents seemed to have improved overall survival. The data was intriguing and therefore led to prospective trial, um, which again, I think it's important um, that we conduct these types of studies, as you will see here. This is the ERA-223 trial um, of patients receiving abiraterone plus minus radium-223, published in Lancet Oncology last year, 800 patients, median follow-up just under two years. Primary endpoint was skeletal event-free survival. And what the trial basically showed was that adding radium-223 to abiraterone did not improve skeletal-related event-free survival. And on the flip side, unfortunately, increased patients' risk of experiencing a fracture, increased patients' risk of osteoporosis. So because radium did not improve its primary endpoint of skeletal-related event-free survival, it is not recommended by the current guidelines to be used in combination with abiraterone. Now, interestingly, only 40% of patients in this trial were on denosumab or bisphosphonate. Remember earlier in the talk and our guidelines that patients with bone metastatic CRPC are recommended to receive those agents. Um, nevertheless, we have a number of other ongoing clinical trials that are investigating the potential use of radium-223 in combination with other agents that are commonly used for MCRPC. And so we await uh, those trials reporting out as to how it may be used. So what do I want to leave you with in conclusion about radium-223? It represents a standard management for patients with bone metastatic, MCRPC, symptomatic bone mets, no visceral mets, no lymph nodes greater than three centimeters. Patients can be either pre- or post-dose cetaxel. It's well-tolerated. It's been demonstrated to improve overall survival. Check and monitor CBCs while in therapy. Where might this be going in the future? Patient selection, combination therapies, and of course, as we heard earlier, the impact of novel imaging and enhanced lesion detection. So with that, I want to stop and thank you very much again for your time and attention today.